Welcome back to Sunless Skies. In the last episode, I did a bit of exploring and found Trader's Wood, which is east and a little bit south of Magdalene's. South, southeast of New Winchester. So I just caught here in the last episode. I think all I did was get a port report or something. Maybe I did that, and then I think I also uh, turned it in my prospect, because if you remember, I had a prospect to deliver five things of literature. And I got super lucky, and the last place I visited actually had a bunch of literature available as a bargain. So turn that in, got a good amount of money now, and now let's actually explore the place. The Wood's Edge Campfire Expedition or the Parting Glade. I think I should check out the more safe places before I take an expedition into the deep of the woods. Let's look at the wood's edge. The wood is vast as a felled giant and fathomless as a great ocean. Like the ocean, much of it is hidden from view. Careful expeditions are required to go deeper into the wood. The forest is rich and wild in the verdant species of the reach. Exploring the starlight dappled edges of the wood could be profitable. You may only perform one of these actions a fortnight. The wood guards its secrets. Good to know. Hunt or gather flowers or slumber. Slumber in the wood. No. That's creepy. Well, 21% chance, 32% chance, or 68. Let's gather flowers, I suppose. Actually, hold on. This says you may gain verdant seeds. I mean, that's not exactly like a super high value thing to get. Verdant seeds aren't worth that much. This says you may gain a caged catch. What is that? The game in the forest is unparalleled. The glories of the sport it offers are spoken of even in the hunting lodges of Port Avon. All oh, right, the hunting lodge that I'm sorta kinda a part of. They're reserving a seat for me or something. This caged catch sounds interesting just because I don't know what it actually is. But 32% chance. Uh, now let's gather flowers. Herbs of Heaven. By a lake, gray as the eye of a storm, you find a promising patch of herbs, green and gold and wonderful. Your crew help you gather those that seem the least familiar, for surely those will fetch the highest price. Deeper in the wood, where the light is almost drowned by the thirsty silverwood trees, you find flowers of every hue of Navarantine. You gather what you can. Go to the campfire. Three figures draped in scholars' robes huddle around a campfire. They're arguing about kings. A banner in the colors of Somerset, London University's most respectable college, gleams in the firelight. As you approach, the discussion dies. One of the scholars, a woman with a fierce expression, stands up. Only scholars should be here. Are you one? Oh, what do I need for this? Unlocked when origin academic is, you study the practical sciences. Hmm, I do have friends, right? What do I need for that? Oh, I need affiliation academia three. I have one. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm surprised my academia is so low. I think my... Ac my uh, Affiliation villainy is higher than my academia, and Elizabeth's character is somebody who, like, studied and is a, a bit of a scientist. Well, I guess, no, I am not. Looks like I have to give them supplies. Perhaps a gift would persuade them to let you enter the camp. They look wretched camped out here. Students of the Grave the vituperative classicist compares your offering with the burnt toast and wan tea that they've been supping, uh, suppering on. Well, all right, I suppose. Burnt, <laughs> burnt toast and wan tea, and you don't want to take my beautiful supplies, which I'm assuming are the 20 kilograms of scones that I have left from Port Avon all those years ago. 
Okay, this is one of those words that I don't know. Vituperative. Vituperative. Bitter and abusive. An example is a vituperative outburst. So, vituperative classicist. The woman is a vituperative classicist, her companions a dismal paleographer, a forlorn young man, and a feckless theologian, a handsome youth with an easy smile. They explain that they are here to enter the regent's grave, where they believe a sleeping king lies buried. They do not agree as to the king's identity. Unfortunately, the college has cut our funding, the classicist explains. Speak to us if you'd be interested in helping. I am. Um, looks like I could speak with them individually before I ask for help. Or wander the camp. Can't do that, though. Have to speak with the scholars first. Yeah, um, alright, well let's speak with the vituperative classicists, since they're the one we first met. The student of the ancient world is armed with more scorn than a vengeful goddess and a firm conviction that the Sumerian queen of heaven sleeps in the regent's grave. The classicist tent is practical and largely unornamented. The interior is damp from her various walking clothes, which have been scattered across the floor. Old playbills and gaudy costume jewelry hang from the tent ceiling like charms. The classicist is pacing the tent, reading... Herodotus while smoking up a storm. Let's ask the classicist about her theory. Why does she believe the ancient Sumerian deity Inanna is buried in a forgotten tomb in the high wilderness? The Queen of Heaven. Isn't it obvious? She rolls her eyes. Fine. I'll tell you what I told the academic senate. The high wilderness is heaven. Not as the church conceives it, but as the Sumerians did. A place of stars and chaos and impossible powers in proximity to and affecting our own world, but far, far removed. She pauses for breath. Inanna, the queen of heaven, entered the underworld in search of her husband and was trapped for a time. That is the myth. This may be the truth. She waves her hand dismissively. Besides, we made some promising discoveries in the wood. That is not very convincing. Um, I feel like I want to talk to them about their theory before I ask them about each other, because I want to get to know all of them before I want to know what they think of each other. So I have something to compare it to. Speak to the feckless theologian. The divinity student has a dozen bad habits and a firm conviction that St. John the Apostle slumbers in the regent's grave. The theologian's tent is the largest of the three. Its interior has been decorated with carpets and throws, which trap the smoke from his hookah. The air is a scented f fugue. I think that's supposed to be fugue. The theologian is reclining on cushions, drinking wine. Ask about his theory. Why does he think St. John is buried in a forgotten tomb in the high wilderness? The Golden Legend. The theologian's eyes widen. He's delighted to have been asked that question. According to the Legenda Aria, St. John is sleeping somewhere, waiting for the coming of the Antichrist. Which would mean the end of the world. And what is the high wilderness but that? We left the world behind, and the stars are going out. And just after we arrive, we discover a tomb hidden in an ancient wood. He runs a hand through his hair. Sometimes we must have faith. That is also not very convincing. They're basically just going on hunches. They're hoping it's there, but they don't have any real reason to believe it's there. The dismal paleographer, the forlorn student of medieval manuscripts, believes that the Emperor Charlemagne lies in the regent's grave. The paleographer's tent is some distance from the rest of the camp, and almost in the forest. It is smaller and more worn than the tents of the others. Inside, however, the tent is both warm and sturdy. No rain leaks through the oil skin. The paleographer's inks and reference books and old theater handbills are neatly sorted. The paleographer is at a little wooden desk, conjugating the subjunctive. <laughs> 
Why does he think the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne is buried in a forgotten tomb in the High Wilderness? The King's duty goes on. It's a little strange, I admit. You certainly won't find this in Einhard. But there are legends that say the great king did not leave his people on death, and instead sleeps in a barrow, waiting for their hour of need. He almost smiles. You query his people? I do not forget that we are British. He pauses for effect. But is our queen not of German parentage? Would not her ancestor look out for her, Europe's greatest monarch, as she embarks on her most significant endeavor? Also not convincing. I suppose it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it'll be probably cleared up when or if we find whoever's buried here. So let's ask them about the classicist. A remarkable scholar and a terrifying goneral. What's a goneral? It's capitalized, so it's a specific thing that maybe only exists in this world. Goneral. Goneril is a character in Shakespeare's tragic play, King Lear. She is the eldest of King Lear's three daughters, along with her sister, Regan. Goneril is considered a villain, obsessed with power and overthrowing her elderly father as ruler of the Kingdom of Britain. According to Wikipedia. At college, when she trod the boards, he shakes his head. Ancient history now. Which is her province, not mine. He makes a strong cup of tea for himself and then offers you the same. Bitterness has curdled her. He sips his drink, then grimaces. Like this milk. <laughs> God, throw it out, you! Let's ask him about the theologian. The paleographer is lost in thought. When he answers you, he looks rueful. The three of us were at college together, in the same year. We're all interested in the theater, but eventually pursued other things. I hadn't seen him in years, until the Traitor's Wood funding came up at the Senate. He sniffs. His intellect is second-rate, but his charm is first class. We can't all be brilliant, he sighs despondently. Speak with a classicist, and ask them about the dismal paleographer. She laughs scornfully, but refuses to be drawn. I will not waste breath on the undeserving. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, feckless theologian. Theologian. Her invective goes for an hour, and she only remembers to fetch you tea midway through. A liar and a traitor and a fool, she says, spooning in entirely too much sugar. I loathe him. Her hand shakes as she pours. And the theologian. Ask him about the classicist. She's very talented and very funny, and not at all nice. And she's furious with me. Why? He won't say. I think I've done enough damage with both of them. He shakes his head. If it weren't for St. John and the academic senate sending me here, I doubt I'd have seen her again. Until she became principal, of course. Ask them about the paleographer. The theologian smiles innocently. Yes, we used to know each other very well indeed. This was back at college. Before all his passion got sucked out of him, he sighs. Some people can't accept change. Okay, I feel like I know them all pretty well. Let's ask how I can help. The scholars intimated that you might be able to help them continue their exploration into the wood. Your inquiry induces a rare spirit of cooperation in the scholars. The last expedition into the woods found a document written in the correspondence. It contained directions to a place called the Steward's Font, the theologian explains. Alas, that is all it needs to break their alliance. The paleographer begins to argue that the steward was a chief position in Charlemagne's household. The classicist makes a pointed reference to Anina's husband. Theologian's smile is forced. If you could find the font, it would be an immense boon to my work. There are sputters of protestation. Our work. You can begin expeditions from expeditions into the deep of the wood. 
I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but the correspondence. I think we talked about the correspondence a bit before when we were doing the whole thing with the obelisk and um, the circus. All that stuff. The correspondence is, I think, the language that's used for the stars to communicate with each other. Which somebody actually told me that that language... Um, you know those glyphs that we keep seeing all over the place, usually associated with horrors? Like this, remember this horror over here on the way to Lustrum? There's all sorts of those interesting symbols around, and there's usually like a red glow around them. Someone told me that those symbols are actually symbols of correspondence. Meaning that the very language that stars use to communicate with each other induces horror? I'm afraid of stars. They don't sound good. Still can't wander the camp. So that was the Somerset camp, right? Yeah. So the Woods Edge, there's nothing to do there. If we already did our thing, basically you get free resources every... Was it every fortnight? Let's check out the parting glade before we do an expedition. The forest rises behind the station where a few tents have been set up. What might be an owl calls from somewhere in the wood. In the far distance, a great stone barrow rises over the trees. The glade, an oasis of wild flowers and sweet meadow field in the midst of the brooding trees, is where captains meet to do business and bring their ventures to the wood to conclusion. Oh, this is where you write a port report, so I guess we haven't done one yet. Outside of the Somerset camp, the great forest of bronzewood trees has gone untouched by human hands. Voices sound in the deeps of the woods, forlorn and far away. The wood is vast and vastly lonely. Let's explore the glade. Birds trill in nearby trees and the sweet scent of flowers pervades the air. There's no one else here at present, but there are signs of recent passage. A discarded set of cups from some clandestine picnic. Loose paper hastily torn from a notebook. A few bullets in scorched grass. People come to the glade to conduct meetings as neutral ground and as a place to think, secluded from the watchful gaze of the high wilderness. Okay, let's do an expedition. Somerset College has, until recently, funded expeditions into the forest. Those who return speak of voices on the wind, of murmurs in uninhabited groves. You must first decide how many crew you wish to take with you on your expedition. The more you take, the likelier is your success, but at a risk of losing them all. Then choose your destination. Ooh. So how many... Oh my god, does this use all your crew? Ten? Uh, hmm. It's a risk of losing them all. If I lost all ten, I mean, I'd be completely screwed. There's no way. It's gonna have to be a small expedition. Yeah, even the small, quote-unquote small expedition uses five. I think I need an upgraded ship to do the large one, really. Unless I really, really, really want to gamble, which I don't. I need three fuel, or no, I need two fuel, and two supplies. Uh, hold on, what can I buy here? Ooh. That maybe changes things. I can buy supplies, but I can't buy fuel. What's the nearest place I can buy fuel? Magdalens? Yeah, they do sell fuel. And it's pretty close by. So I think we'll be okay. Right, this uses two fuel, so I'm going to have what I already have loaded plus an extra one. Yeah, that'll be enough to get to Magdalene's. Let's prepare for a small expedition. Into the wood. A handful of your most loyal crew volunteer to join you. They hoist packs and eye each other with grim satisfaction.
You must decide what your expedition's destination is. Expeditions for outlandish artifacts are easier than for bronzewood. Occasionally, a quest will require you to choose a unique destination. If you leave while you have crew embarked on an expedition, they will not be available until you complete the expedition. Right, well, definitely Stuart's font. The other stuff is just basically for resources? The Somerset scholars believe that the font will provide clues to the identity of the king in the region's grave. This is an expedition of moderate difficulty. The Pale Wood. The scholars share individually what they know. Their transcriptions of the correspondence differ significantly, and they refuse to work together on a single translation. Still, it should be enough to get to the general area of the font. You gather your crew and make for the edge of the Whispering Wood. The scholars emerge from their tents to wave you off. Thunder shakes the trees. Storm's nearing, a signaler says, drawing up her hood. Should we be out in this, Captain? Hmm. So take shelter is a safer but slower option. Brave the storm is risky but faster. Oh, well, I mean, heck, I have 100% chance of success. So really, there is no risk, right? Yeah, brave the storm. A harsh captain. Brandy is passed about in little flasks until you have to remind people not to get rotten drunk in the middle of a thunderstorm. <laughs> the going is quieter after that, but swifter. Eventually the storm passes. Far and farther into the woods you must go. You emerge into a field of purple flowers, bright as new bruises. Captain, the stoker's voice is anxious. Can you hear them? Something whispers from beneath the petals. Stop our ears or listen to the voices. 91% chance of success. That's very good. And stopping the ears, not very good chance. And you have to do something, right? Either stop your ears or listen to them. Otherwise, you just have to leave. So let's listen. Yes. The scent of the flowers is sweet but sour, like that of rotten raspberries. The smell overpowers your nostrils as the voices overwhelm your ears, filling them with a constant babble. Your crew join you in the long grass, wandering through the cacophony of flowers. Petals open tiny mouths. They whisper directions, only half in a language you speak. They tell you of groves and graves, the treacheries which happened, the defiance, the kingdom overthrown. Eventually, they even tell you the way to leave. <laughs> that is so cool. Petals open tiny mouths. They sound cute. The ground gives way to a bog, gray and fetid as a newly slain corpse. It burps lazily. The marsh reads, Cercerate, growing in volume as you approach. There's English amidst the polyphony. Names. Yours and those of your crew. Okay, that's creepy. Also, what does... Cercerate mean. The marsh reads Cercerate. Cercerate. Um, of wind, uh, of leaves, wind, etc. make a whispering or rustling sound. Example, the grass cercerated underfoot. Interesting. I like that word, Cercerate. It's kind of fun to say. Yeah, so when it's saying the marsh reads cercerate growing in volume, volume as you approach, it's talking about them like whispering. They're getting louder and louder, whispering our names. Cross or search for another route. Crossing, 32% chance of success. Another route, 68. There must be a better, less noisome way. Yes. The wood extends for miles, but so too does the bog as though it were once a river or a moat. It's hours before you find a passable clearing, a glade of emerald hue nestled between a copse of silver trees that shiver and sigh like consumptives. The trees whisper as you pass. They lie in a dozen languages, only half known to you and your crew. The discordance shivers beneath the boughs. 
correspondence ignites wood that shrieks, as though not meant to speak it. Wood burns and breaks. The passing is treacherous and slow. Eventually, however, you emerge. It is not the date that it was. <laughs> Got a tale of terror. Ah, finally we're there. Enter the steward's font. Below the thundering white water, a cave is visible just under the lip of the rock. A scythe of starlight. You scale down the wet rock face and into the cave. It's several moments before your eyes adjust to the light. The cavern is not natural. The walls are covered with bronze wood and studded with naravatine gemstones, driven in too deep to remove. Distant starlight from the cave mouth reflects off the stones, filling the cave with radiance. Towards the back of the cave, you find a silver seal the size of a crown and a curved crescent blade. Correspondence is scored on the blade's battered metal. It is too large to move, but you record the sigils. Perhaps one of the scholars will be able to translate. You take the seal. You found a blade in the steward's font. Return to the scholars. And we have our crew back. Okay. Oh, so I... Oh, so I can ask them all individually what they think about what I found. And then I guess I have to come up with, like, my best idea for <laughs> which one I should believe. Um... Mm. Maybe the paleographer first. Choose the paleographer to translate the sigils on the scythe from the steward's font. You will only be able to consult one scholar. They do not share their findings with rivals and guard their research jealously. Oh, interesting. Wow, this could really be different depending on who you choose. I don't know, I think the paleographer is kind of interesting. Right, they're the one that thinks the... I think Charlemagne is buried there. Yeah, okay, let's do them. The Giggling Place. The dismal paleographer grabs your notes eagerly. He's swift to an initial translation. This is a gift for service. Kerling... Carolingian, Carolingian kings gave gifts, spoils, riches, offices for loyalty. He pauses. Eh? What's this? The paleographer labors over your notes for several hours. At last, he rises from his desk. I think this was given as an office. Tamer of the king's bower. But that's no position that I know of. It gave authority over the giggling place located somewhere down deep... Uh, do you have a map? It would be easier. He scrawls markings onto your map. Take an expedition to the giggling place. That is... Hmm. Yeah, you know, given what I experienced going in there for the first time, that sounds very, very ominous. 250 sovereigns. Thank you. Oh, I'm not going to have the fuel to do another expedition, am I? Because I'm going to have to spin the supplies all over again. Let's just double check that. Yeah. And I want to do a large expedition too. But to do that I need to upgrade my ship, obviously. Hmm. Okay, I think I know what I want to do. I'm going to head over to Magdalene's just as a quick stop to get some fuel and supplies on my way to New Winchester, and then at New Winchester, I want to try to buy some upgrades, but I want to make sure that they're upgrades that are going to be useful on not just this ship, but also the next one I'm going to buy. Therefore, I'm not wasting the money investing, you know, resources into a ship I'm going to get rid of pretty soon. Because there's probably going to be some overlap, I hope. That also means I need to decide on what ship I'm going to actually buy out of the two. Uh, anyway, yeah, let's get to New Winchester. You know what, before doing that, I should probably grab the bargain here. More barrels of unseasoned hours. I think I have like 20 of these at this point. And I should probably buy a couple supplies to make sure I don't run out on my way to Magdalene's before I get fuel. Okay, 
Now to Magdalene's, and then New Winchester. Oh, hello. Can I just mention again that I love this new weapon? And I didn't even pay for it. A solid crate. Barrel of unseasoned hours. At Magdalene's now. No deals. Let's grab a couple fuel. And that should be plenty. Alright, New Winchester now. Just turned in my port reports, had three of them, and now I have enough to affect the balance of power in the reach. So, stovepipes are still desperate. I mean, I don't think they can go below zero, so that's as desperate as they can get. Tacadus are 97, thriving. And I am at 140 reputation, still beloved. You know what? I've decided... I'm gonna go all in. We're gonna buy a new ship.